grateful for the Oradolas entrusting me to come and speak to you this morning. And, you know, I got some things on my heart, stuff I've been waiting to get out, you know, so get ready, strap in, you know, I've been up here to preach a full length sermon, so, you know, I'm going to take my time. Don't clock me. Don't, don't hit me with the T. No, I'm just messing with you guys. I got two very brief points for us this morning, and we're going to weave this right on in to communion. But, you know, this is a very special time of year. Really, for me and my family, it's always been a very, very exciting time for me. I can't remember a time when it wasn't. I always loved Christmas time. It was me and my family, we get together and we decorate and we'd, we'd put in the little CD player. I think my dad still has that CD player. And we would put the Motown Christmas songs on. And we play it from top to bottom, and we would play that album all throughout the holiday season. And my sister would be in there, and my mom would be getting the house all festive and nice, while my father and I would be very shakily and very uh, timidly climbing up 30 feet up onto a ladder, trying to put Christmas lights onto the house. And very nerve-wracking, and I hated doing it every year. And I remember my dad had got older. He's like, he's like, man, I'm getting too old to go up there. Every time I, I, I'm starting to get nervous. You know, every time I go up there, I'm starting to fear for my life. I don't know if it's me getting older. And I was like, that's how I feel all the time. I don't know. I, you know, I'm supposed to be your son, and I'm freaking out already. But it's always been a very fun time for me. You know, my sister and I, we'd watch uh, A Christmas Story, if anybody has seen that. It's probably on TV right now today, all day on one channel, uh, just playing over and over and over again. But there's so many memories, so many memories that are dear to me. But Christmas means something different now. I have the honor and privilege of being married to my beautiful wife, Kira. I don't know where she's at right now. And we have a beautiful baby girl named Camille. Uh, the joy of my world. I love her so much. And so now I get the opportunity to make memories with my family. And, you know, Christmas means something a little bit differently when you have your own family. That means working long hours, a little overtime here and there, lots of money being sent, spent, you know, uh, being left to the task of building my daughter's toys, which I hope that she's not too discouraged by on Christmas morning. Because uh, we do not know how that is going to work out. She's finally at the age where she's like, oh, ah, you know. She can see and know that she's receiving gifts. But all jokes aside, you know, Christmas has taken on a different meaning, a different spiritual meaning for me as well. And really, it's, it, it's reminded me of what gifts really are and how special they are from God. And so the title of our lesson today is The Gift That Keeps On giving. The gift that keeps on giving. And, and God gives us tons of gifts. Go ahead. Everybody take a deep breath in. And out. God's giving you air. God's given us so many different things that we can take for granted. But there's one in particular that I want to talk about today. Our first point today is a gift to the world. A gift to the world. Let's go over to Luke chapter 2. Now, I'm not going to take you through every ounce and piece of Jesus' birth here, but I want to focus on something that I believe really God put on my heart and really stuck out. And just so you know what's happening here is there's this man named Simeon, and he was a righteous man, the Bible says. And it says that the Holy Spirit told him that you are going to live to see the Messiah. And it says, until that day, you will not die. Now, that's really encouraging to know that the Holy Spirit has set you up to see God's Savior. But that's also a little discouraging because you're like, man, as soon as I see the Messiah, I'm out. But that's not Simeon's heart. He's full of joy and excitement. To see the Messiah. How do we know? Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 29. Luke chapter 2, verse 29. The Bible reads here, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. 
For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. See, the Holy Spirit had led Simeon right to this day, led him right into the temple. As soon as, Jesus, as, soon as Mary and Joseph were coming to dedicate Jesus to God. Why? Every firstborn male had to be devoted at the temple to God. And so Jesus was coming to be presented. And it shows that Jesus here being presented is something that is very, very special. And, you know, he says something very special about who Jesus is. A few things here. He's the salvation of all nations. The light of all Gentiles. The glory of of the Israelites. And this is very, very odd because the Jewish people at this time, the Israelites, knew that salvation was coming from them and for them. But he was helping them to understand that this salvation was going to be greater than just the people of Israel, that it would be the Gentiles, it would be all the nations which we see here sitting today. Jesus was a special gift from God. You know, God kept this man alive for this very special day just to see the face of his firstborn son. It, it, it literally didn't say he didn't have any other purpose except for that, that God had saved him on this earth. I don't know, I'm assuming he was an older man at this point, to wait to see the salvation of God. And this is kind of the same feeling that, that parents get when they have a child. You know, they want to start showing them off there, want to bring them to different places, but not too close, right? They want to start showing them off because it's a precious gift. Psalm chapter 127 and verse 3, the Bible says that children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from him. And that word heritage there means a gift, a gift from God. And, and when you see a newborn, your eyes light up. Just like how kids feel on Christmas morning when they see those gifts, their eyes light up. They see all the toys, all the things that they're going to play with, all the things that God has given them. And I think about when I had my baby girl, Camille, and the day that she was born. Now, Kiara knows, but I was pretty ticked off in the hospital right there because things didn't go according to my plan and the way I wanted Camille to come into the world, but she was safe and sound. And I remember just, just standing there, actually sitting there, and I don't know what Kiera was doing, I don't know, she was probably taking a nap or something because she just gave birth to a child. And I was, I was sitting there in the chair and I was staring at her for an hour straight. I was just looking at her I did not take my gaze off of her for an hour straight. Why? Because I was in awe of what God had done. I was amazed looking at this little creation that, you know, looks like here, but amazed at this little creation that God had brought into this world and the gift that he had given me. I was amazed. And that same joy that a parent has when, when, when seeing their child is the exact same joy that God had when Jesus was being brought into the world. That's why he saved Simeon for that specific purpose, just to see his son, because it was so dear to him. Speaking of gifts, right, there, there's a gift that came with this son, and that's the salvation of the world. Let's go over to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Let's talk about this special gift here. In verse 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Salvation here is a gift. It's nothing you can work for or anything that you can earn. Just like the toys that I'm sure you received on Christmas as a kid or the toys or gifts that you received on your birthday. It's nothing you worked for. And dare I say, I'm sure some of us probably didn't deserve anything, even less a candy cane, because we was probably knuckleheads when we were little. But yet our parents still loved us enough and were graceful enough to buy us toys or get us whatever they could 
some of our parents couldn't afford an enormous amount of things, but they did it. Why? Because they wanted to see that joy on our face. And that's exactly what God wanted to give us. And he gave that to us in his son. He gave us that in eternal salvation. And we didn't receive it because we worked hard for it. No, the Bible actually says we've worked for and earned death. That's the wages that we've earned. That's what we've worked for. Hell, an eternity away from God. And the Bible explains hell in a very odd manner, I believe. It says that it's full of darkness and fire. Now, I don't know about you, but that just doesn't make sense. Because usually when I'm sitting next to the fire, it's, it's nice and warm. I understand that. But, but there's, it's usually giving me light. But here it's saying hell is dark and fire. Things that just do not make sense. That's why none of us should be aiming to go there. And really when you think about it, all hell is is just an absence of God. So just imagine if God was to take his presence from this world right now. No more sun right? It'd be darkness. It'd be fire. That's the absence of God. And that's kind of like how our lives were in the world, full of darkness and a bunch of fires going on around us. Our lives were on fire without God. The deepest, darkest depression had consumed our lives at a point. Shameful impurity and immorality that, that left us hiding and, and scurrying away from the world, ashamed. Drugs and alcohol that just had us captive. Terrible relationships with people that cared nothing for us, nor we cared for them. But claimed we did and said we love each other. But we're doing nothing but harming one another. God has offered us a gift that allows us to live away from that torturous life. And so I have a simple challenge for those who are visiting here today. Accept that gift of salvation that God has for you. Study the Bible. Get baptized and live in God's eternal salvation. For the disciples, those who study the Bible and been baptized, I want to encourage us to start the year right. The new year has not come yet, but we still have an opportunity to bring the new year in powerfully. And we're having this little thing called the Winter Workshop that I want to implore everybody to get to. Please take the time to go. I remember I got baptized November 11th in 2012, and and not not just a month later, we were having the Winter Workshop. And I was in awe of all the disciples. And at this point, every single one of the world sector leaders would come in. And so it'd be like a little mini uh, global leadership conference there. And people would be coming in. And I'm meeting all these new people. I mean, I was at the airport for the airport runs. And people were coming in, just standing there, excited, and building new relationships with our brothers and sisters from different countries. It was such a joyful time. And we're going to even have the privilege of having churches from other states come and join us this year. And so let's not miss this opportunity to bring this year in in a powerful way, to to take that gift. Because there's times where you've been a disciple for a little while and you start to forget and lose that joy, that happiness, that that, that Simeon shared when he saw, saw Jesus. We can lose that so easily. And so getting our year started out, making sure that we are present at the Winter Workshop is going to be amazing preaching, and I know that God is going to be glorified. My second and final point, salvation, it's worth regifting. Now, be honest, how many of us here have regifted something? All right, some of us aren't telling the truth in here. But, you know, you you get something and and somebody presents it to you at work or, you know, it's a white elephant gift. You kind of didn't, you ended up with it. You didn't want it. And so you you open it up. Oh, my gosh, you're you're so excited. Thank you so much. And you take it back home and you wrap it right on up again and you give it. I know somebody else who could use this. I know somebody else who could use this right here. It has no use here, but I'm going to make sure that somebody gets it. Regifting. And that's not always a bad thing. And I believe in this case, this is the best thing we can re-gift. And that's salvation. Amen? Let's go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 
2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 11. The Bible reads, since then we know what it is, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. Since then we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade men. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is plain to your conscience. We're not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, it is for the sake of God. If we're in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And that he died for all, that those should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. I love this passage. And there's two things we can really glean from this passage. Fear and love. Fearing God is what moves us to fight and to persuade those who are perishing around us. The word perish means to suddenly die. And that's almost what it seems like as soon as people are taken captive by sin. It almost seems like they're dying right before us. Once the drugs start to take over their lives, once they're in these terrible relationships, it seems that they've died right before our eyes. And it also says love. Love for God is what forces us to live for him and not for ourselves anymore. And so we've got to ask ourselves, if we've stopped fighting to persuade the lost, we've lost our fear for God. If we stop living for God and started to live for anything else besides him, according to the scripture, we have lost touch with the love of Christ. There's a simple solution. Fear God. Which means you have to have a sober look at who God is. I, I, I compel you, go ahead, read a little bit through Exodus right there. And you really start to see how much our God desires righteousness. That he wasn't standing for anything. And that's not the different God that we serve. It's the exact same God we worship today. He expected reverence. There was a point in time where people couldn't enter into the Holy of Holies without a rope tied around their waist. Because if they sinned while they were in there, somebody would have to drag them out. Because God expects holiness and righteousness. That's got to put a reverent fear in our heart. We forget that. We have to fear God. We're like, you know, I'm covered by grace and God's forgiven me. That is true. But God does not take sin lightly. And I know Satan's been tempting us. Things have slowed down. We didn't have Bible talk, Devo. And we can start to lose touch that, that really we're not here just to show up to meetings of the body. We're here to have a relationship with God. Genesis 15 explains it. He says to Abraham, I am your great reward. God is our reward. That's what we're here for. Because when we stand before him, we're like, look at this guy baptized, look at this woman, look at all these things. I No, we're going to have a relationship with God to stand on. The love of Christ, that is the cross. We have to go back to the foot of the cross in humility. Just think about what your life looked like right when you were studying the Bible. All of the terrible things that had been done to you. All the terrible things you had done, and you were like, God, please take this away from me. I want nothing to do with this life. It's empty. It's painful. It's void. And that's what the cross gave us, a peace, a contentment that cannot be destroyed. From Genesis until now, till today. God has been fighting to bring men back into a relationship with him. He's been trying to save the souls. From the minute that Adam and Eve got kicked out, God set a plan in motion. He's like, I'm going to make sure to bring people back into a relationship with me. And what has he done? He has now commissioned us, disciples, to bring all of humanity back into the relationship with him that he intended from the Garden of Eden. God's always intended to commune with us, to have a relationship with us. That's everybody's purpose. 
That is literally the, the person sitting next to you at work, uh, the person you see on the bus, your neighbor. Their actual purpose is to be in communion with God. That's why their lives are void and empty. And why your coworkers spend time talking about drugs and alcohol and the sex that they had last night. Because they're trying to fit all of these worldly things into the God-sized hole in their heart. God created us to commune with him. He created the Garden of Eden so that we can go outside, hey God, and spend time with him. But because of sin, he had to separate himself from us. But he didn't leave it like that. He was like, I'm going to fight. And he took hundreds. He took thousands. He took as long as it could so that we could have salvation today. Got to share in that. Hey, you can clap it up for salvation. Man. God intended that for us. God's special purpose was for us to have that relationship with him. And I want to encourage us, you know, as we see the world around us the way it is. The world is restless without God. And he wants to give them rest. He wants everyone to share in it. And we have here something very special in the kingdom. Where we don't have to put on fake faces or facades. You can come in struggling. That's okay. We're going to make sure to get in there with you, encourage you, and, and show you a scripture Lift your, hey, bro, come on over here. I got a scripture I want to share you. Or maybe you got that harsh brother or sister that kind of disciples you real hard, and you're kind of like, what? Like, you know, it's not what I was looking for, but you got to kind of weed through in there and, and find the, the gems to take into your heart so that you can be changed. That's, that's the special thing about the kingdom of God. And the Bible actually says that it was God's set purpose for us to be a part of his kingdom. How do we know? Let's go for the Matthew chapter 25. A few more scriptures here. We'll bring it in for a landing. Matthew chapter 25, and I love this passage because people always complain, well, how can a loving God create a hell? That's not loving. An eternity of fire? Well, they haven't read the Bible, that's why. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 34, the Bible reads, Then the king will say to those, we well, actually still have a little bit of understanding of what's happening. This is the passage where it's saying when the Son of Man comes. Now, this is the passage here in this chapter that is not a parable, which I believe is a foreshadowing of what's actually going to happen. It says that the Son of Man is going to come and he's going to separate men like sheep and goats. And if you know anything about sheep, they're very prideful, right? They're ready to ram you. They chew up everything. They don't really listen. And you have sheep. They're dumb. They're not very smart. They're very timid. They need to be in groups, but when they have their shepherd around them, they're very obedient. And that's what keeps them safe. And it says that God is going to separate and right and left, on the left, the goats, on the right, his sheep. And it says in verse 34, then the king will say to those on his right, come, you are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. God had created the kingdom of God for us from the beginning of time. Hell was never created for you. Who was it prepared for? Verse 41. Glad you asked. It says, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me. You who are cursed into the eternal fire. Prepare for the devil and his angels. Hell was never created for us. Heaven, the kingdom of God was. That was our inheritance. So why would any of us want to go to a place that is not prepared for us? Why would we want to allow anybody to go to a place that's not prepared for them? Why? Because God is holy. He will separate because he has to do it. He is just. And the world is longing and looking for this kingdom. It's restless without it. I got one more scripture for us here in Matthew chapter 11. Let's bring it to a close here. We know that God has a rest for his people. He has a rest for those who are looking for it. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28, it says, come to me all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. 
take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for what? Your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I love this passage because Jesus is saying, hey, I know you're restless. I know that sin that you've been in, all of that darkness, that terrible relationship you've been fighting to get out of, that you can't seem to get out of. It says, I have rest for you. I have it over here. And he says, he says, what do we need to do? He says, I will give you rest. He says that Jesus gives us rest. Rest is not taken. You can't take rest. So as much as you may lay down and sleep for hours, and you can't, you can't take it. It says, Jesus gives it to you. It says, my, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. It says, his, his yoke is light, it's easy, it's burdensome. But we've got to learn to carry that yoke. We've got to learn to have that. I mean, when, when things start to come into your life as a disciple that you've never experienced, you have to then learn how to carry that light yoke still. Because you can start to, uh, it's feeling a little heavy here. And that's how I started feeling this week. I was overwhelmed. I was like, man, I feel like everything should be slowing down and calming down. But I still have so much to do. Little situations going on in the ministry. I started getting frustrated and restless. But it was because I, I, I hadn't learned to take on that yoke. And my wife, she's so spiritual. She said, she was like, you know what? I've been, I was watching this, listening to this podcast. And it was just talking about, um, it was talking about, God stretching us and that God will put a lot on our plates because he's trying to to stretch our bandwidth so that we can do more for him but also so that we can rely on him and it's such a very like yeah duh, that, that's what we're supposed to do but I was like man like this is profound I needed this this week I was feeling restless and some of us may be feeling restless today All right Satan's got a hold of you but look to the person you're right and left. Those are the companions you can go to to be open, to lay all those burdens before one another so you can lay them before God. It is a peace that comes from God that we cannot get anywhere else. And, you know, I think of a, a very special person I want to lift up here, and that's our brother who just turned 19 years old, Jesse Aguilar. And when you see him, he just kind of takes the burden right off your shoulders there. He gives you a nice warm hug. He's always dressed really fly. You're like, man, like this, this brother looks good. And on top of that, he has a burden and a cross that most of us don't know that he carries. This man gets on a bus for hours from Santa Fe Springs all the way to Cal State Northridge to go to school multiple times throughout the week. And then he goes, and he's part of the ministry up there. Then he takes the bus from Santa Fe Springs on his day off, and he comes to Dominguez Hills where he's reaching out to people, not only in Northridge, but also in Dominguez Hills. And I've never heard the man complain. Some of us had to get drugged out the bed this morning. And he gets up every single morning because he's grateful. He, he loves to re-gift his salvation. How do I know? His mom's a disciple. His little brother, Gavin, is studying the Bible. He's not even a teenager. And he's studying the Bible because of Jesse's heart. You know, I have a simple challenge for us. We're coming into a new year. There's so many more souls that need to be saved. But we can only grow as much as we're able to handle. So what does that mean? It's, it means that all of us here, we need to raise up. We really need to take it on to our hearts and our minds. If you're not discipling somebody, then I'm going to disciple somebody this year. If you are discipling people, I'm going to raise up to become a Bible talk leader. I'm going to ask my Bible talk, what do I need to do so that I can help this ministry continue to grow, so that we continue to pour into that foundation, so Southland, Metro Coast, and the AV region can continue to grow and glorify God. Our newly baptized brother and sister are like, well, I'm not ready to take anybody on here. Find a place to serve. Yeah. Brother Mason Federica, he says, you know what? He used to tell me all the time, serving keeps me faithful. And I totally agree with that. The first thing I did when I became a disciple, I started ushering. 
And then shortly after, got uh, wrangled into the song ministry. That's usually what happens. You get wrangled oh, there. And I've been able to serve there. There's always places for you to serve. AV. They need like, look, Mario's fired up to have somebody back there to help them out. Um, and then we also have counting. There's so many different areas to serve. Please find a place to serve. Don't, this isn't, we don't come to the kingdom just to receive. We come to give. And I hope, you know, we have had the, the opportunity today to really reflect on what this season is truly about. I think that the theme has been so consistent all throughout the lesson and that, that, all throughout the service, and that wasn't planned. That's the Holy Spirit. Let's leave service having made some decisions. The new year's around the corner. Let us begin today. Whatever we believe we're holding on, waiting for, you know, January 1, start now. Change that now. And I want to close out with a quote here by Vance Havner. He's a Christian author, preacher. And he said, Christmas is based on an exchange of gifts. The gift of God to man, his unspeakable gift of his son. And the gift of man to God. When we present our bodies a living sacrifice. Let's be living sacrifices. Let's continue to re-gift the gift of salvation. And let's glorify our God. I love you all. To God be all the glory.